Howdy, folks. Welcome to Redneck Gone Green. I'm David Cobb. I am the Redneck, and you damn right I've gone green. And it is my hope that I can convince you to join me and millions of others in peaceful, nonviolent revolution. That is to say, a commitment to restructuring the fundamentally racist, sexist, and class oppressive world that we're currently living in and return to an indigenous worldview where we are in proper balance, not just with each other, but with all of life. And y'all, I want to be clear. I have clarity that uh, we are in a revolutionary moment. And I don't mean that in a uh, sort of romanticized way. I mean that in a very explicit way, which is to say society is currently being reorganized, whether we like it or not. Uh, this is a result of the profound technological transformation about how goods and services are both created and distributed, specifically automation, robotics, now artificial intelligence. What we're seeing is a transformation. So we are literally not just in late stage capitalism. We're in end stage of the global current capitalist framework. But don't just so, uh, applaud that. Because if we don't actually do something, fascism will be the new way that political economy operates. So this entire program is to ask ourselves the question, what world do we want to live in and how do we actually get there? So I, I hope you share with me both a sense of urgency, but also a sense of hope and empowerment that we can actually live in a new world. And it's with that I am really excited about this program because tonight we're going to actually be talking about time banking, which is a, well, I was going to say a new way of thinking about currency and um, the exchange of services and skills, but it's actually an ancient one. It is a re remembering, if you will, to what we once had and once did as humans. In fact, uh, it's how all humans existed for most of the time we've been on this planet. And so joining us today uh, to talk about that is Mike Strode. Mike Strode is really uh, uniquely qualified to have this conversation. Mike is the founder and chief collaborator and cooperator at the Cola Nut Collaborative. He's also with me on the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network Board of Directors. But wait, there's more. Mike is also on the Board of Directors of the New Economy Coalition, the Dill Pickle Food Cooperative. He's program manager at the Open Collective Foundation and what I know because he's also a friend, a new grandfather. Mike Strode, welcome to Redneck Gone Great. Thank you very much, David. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm really excited. Like, I got to start with you are a new grandfather. I so, am a new grandfather. I, yes. So, it, so I have the privilege of knowing you, Mike. So I'm going to actually back up a bit. You heard the introduction, right? Big picture. But I want to actually start with Mike Strode, the human being, right? Okay. Tell yeah. us a bit about how did you get here to be doing all this amazing solidarity economy work? Like, who are you and why do you do what you do? Uh, yes. So I am someone who is genuinely curious about the world. Um, I am someone who is who, who enjoys experimenting with new technologies, with new strategies, with new approaches, and really exploring my relationship with other human beings. Um, in terms of the way that I approached the org approached organizing, you know, I uh, came to organizing initially through religious organizing. I was part of an interfaith group that organized around the Inglewood neighborhood of Chicago. And inside of that space, I was trying to engage with different religious groups to see if they might want to collaborate and to coordinate with one another around some of the work that they might have been doing in communities. And ultimately, um, that that is an entry point for what what my organizing evolved into. So my organizing eventually would transition me to be coming engaged with Black Oak Center for Sustainable Renewable Living, a Healthy Food Hub, and eventually to the Cold Nut Collaborative. And all of that happened because ultimately I was genuinely concerned about what was happening in the lives of other people. I was genuinely concerned about how I could make an impact in the world. And I wanted to better understand, you know, what are some of the deeper, deeper systemic changes 
or things that were happening beneath the surface of the world that I might impact, that I might affect so that the world might be tra transformed and changed. Fantastic. And Mike, uh, I love the, the arc and, and how you started with, I'm a genuinely curious human. And I've had experienced you that way, right? Uh, and I also appreciated how you talk about both Black Oak and then the Food Hub and then the Cola Nut co uh, Collaborative. Can, can you uh, tease out a little bit about, like, to me, that's a natural arc. I bet it is to you as well. But for our viewers and our listeners, explain that arc of from Black Oak uh, to the Food Hub to the Cola Nut Collaborative. Yeah. So this actually maybe connects further to your question about being, you know, uh, me as a human. Um, so I encountered a place called Black Oak Center for Sustainable Renewable Living while I was on the parent council of my daughter's school, Betty Shabazz International Charter School in uh, the Grand Crossing neighborhood here in Chicago. I got to stop and you because I know <laughs> the name Betty Shabazz, but I bet some yes. folks don't. So it, it needs to be said. Tell us, tell us why that name is so important. Betty Shabazz is resonant because that was the widow of, of Malcolm X. And, and ultimately that school was named after, after, um, you know, after the great Betty Shabazz, uh, because ultimately the, the desire was to instill um, an African centeredness and African lens into the hearts and minds of black children in that, that community, in that neighborhood. And part of that involved getting them engaged in other things, you know? So one of the things that ended up being part of our, my role on the parent council was bringing Black Oak Center to the, the school to launch what they called their healthy food hub, which ultimately you had families in that school that were vegan or that were gluten-free or that had other types of special dietary needs. And we were trying to figure out how we could get those families closer to the food system that they desired that was not available in their surrounding community. And this is uh, circa 2008. And it was through my relationship with Black Oaks that I came to understand permaculture, understand agroecology, and have a really systemic understanding of the environment and our food system. And it is that lens that led me to both time banking as a practice that we could engage in in community as in order to figure out how we could better meet our needs as a community, but also to a systemic lens around how to think about um, environment and ecology as they relate to economy and a systemic view of the economy as something that I actually could have an impact on and that was not primarily concerned with my household budget or was not primarily concerned with dollars, but was really concerned with how we structure ourselves so that we can meet our social needs. And you know, Mike, what I love every time I have a conversation with you, whether it's you know private, whether it's an organizing uh, small group or whether it's public conversations like this, you always break it down without dumbing it down, right? Like you, you speak plainly and simply, but also clearly, right? And what I love about this notion of, and y'all, I want uh, all of us to be thinking about, you know, economy is not something that only economists can understand. It's not something that only experts can know. Like the reality is the word economy comes from the Greek. And Mike, I know you know it, so uh, I'll put you on the spot. W Translate economy from the Attic Greek for us. From the Greek, oikos, home. And so the management of home and the study of home, you know, I mean, ec economy and ecology are related. And ultimately, how we care for home and, and what does home mean? You know, I, I mean, certainly there's an element of capitalism that that causes us to confine home to just our immediate family to just the people we are in direct relationship with, but there's a possibility for us inside of, of the framework of the solidarity economy and other economic frameworks to expand our view of what home means and how we manage home and how we make a world together that meets the needs of all. And let's just be very explicit and clear that expansive view of home is actually a remembering what our ancestors always knew. And that was the home was the forest or the savanna or the jungle, whatever the, the, the ecosystem, right? Yeah. Or environment, like there was no different, there was no such thing as humans separate from the environment for our ancestors. We were literally nested within it. And the economy was about, oh, nurturing mother earth in right relationship reciprocal relationship uh, with not just, you know, our, our protein source or our, our, you know, gardens, but literally the forest itself. 
uh, and the trees and mm -hmm. all of life was actually a reciprocal relationship. It, it, this notion of commodifying uh, was just not part of our ancestors worldview. And I want to use that to segue. And I bet you can already predict mm -hmm. where I'm going because the Cola Nut Collaborative is very particularly named, isn't it? Absolutely so. And and yeah, I'll just kind of extend on what you'd said, right? You know, if you think about home as place and as, as place-based societies, as us remembering our own personal indigeneity and our, our own social, our own cultural indigeneity, um, if you poison the river for one household, all of the households suffer. And so home meant like all of the people around you, because it wasn't possible that, you know, you could just protect the four walls of your own building and then and then, you know, you, you wouldn't have the chance of being knocked over by, by something assailing that village. And so ultimately, the Cold and Not Collaborative is, is actually um, situated in that context. It comes out of uh, West African cultures and, and, and ethnicities, particularly Igbo cultures and Yoruba cultures. And the Cold and Not is something that's traded in West African society as a symbol of hospitality, as a symbol of welcoming. When you walk into an Igbo household, uh, if you are not welcomed with the kola nut, it's very possible that they are trying to rush you out the door. But, you know, you might take a piece of kola nut, you might break it apart, you might each take a, a sliver of that kola nut, drink some water or drink some soda with it. And that is a symbol of you being wel graciously welcomed into that household. And between villages, you might trade a basket of kola nuts to say, I want to have a beneficial trading relationship with you. So in my mind, you know, when I thought about the Cold Nut Collaborative, it's currency that has both value and values. And ultimately, I was trying to help us think about um, something beyond the dollar, which, you know, it has a certain set of values embedded in it. Do we think about those values each time we spend the dollar? Maybe, maybe not. So ultimately, the Cold Nut Collaborative was meant to expand our thinking to think about what other ways we could trade and exchange. Folks, you're listening and or watching Redneck Gone Green. This is a weekly podcast video blog where we ask ourselves, what world do we want to live in? And most importantly, how the hell do we get there? Uh, tonight, tonight we, we come on weekly. Our show is uh, live. And so if you're watching live, you can join the conversation by making a comment into either YouTube uh, we're also on Rumble. We're also uh, either on or soon will be on Facebook. And I also want to say, uh, check it out. We're about to go into podcast uh, format as well. We're talking to Mike Strode. Mike is a solidarity economy theorist and practitioner. Uh, he is with the Dill Pickle Food Cooperative and on the board of directors of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network and the New Economy Coalition. Uh, in addition, he's the program manager at Open Collective and a founder and a chief cooperator at the Cola Nut Collaborative. Mike, mm -hmm. I want to get us now directly into, tell us, and we'll do it this way, tell us mm -hmm. conceptually about what time banking is, and then we'll get into what does that look like at the Cola Nut uh, Collaborative very concretely. So let's mm -hmm. start with what the heck is a time bank? A time bank. It is a bank of time. <laughs> so it's trading time as a currency. It's treating the hours in your day as if they were a type of currency that you could exchange with other people. So one of the things that I genuinely love to do is I love to ride my bike. I love to teach people how to ride bikes. I love to help people better understand how to you know, manage and, and maintain their own bike. And so ultimately, if I were in the time bank and I were offering a service up to, some, to the time bank, I might offer um, some 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 bike maintenance tips, some bike maintenance tips and bike riding strategies. And I might do that for two hours of my time. So if I offer that to someone in the time bank and they take me up on that offer, I earn two hours in the time bank that I can then use to spend on something that I need. And I always need household organizing support or, or garage organizing support. So that's something I could take my two hours seek support inside of the time bank for someone to help me organize my garage. And in that way, we've banked our time and we've spent our time with other people. So time banking is really about this process of, of both mapping out the needs and uh, it needs in a community. So what do people need? Do they need garage organizing support? Do they need bike maintenance? Do they need someone to look after an elder? Mapping out the needs, mapping out the offers. So the things that people have to offer inside of their community um, and bike maintenance, garage organizing, facilitation, uh, workshop design, whatever it might be. And then matchmaking between those offers and using the time as just a way to 
to grease the wheels, you know, just to make sure that that the, the, the exchange is fluid. You know, what I love about this, Mike, as you're describing it is it is premised on uh, really a conviction, not just a belief, but a conviction that everyone has some unique skill, knowledge, or experience that can benefit other people. So it gets us, it both celebrates the individual uh, and unique uh, skills and knowledge and so forth, but it also puts it in the context of reciprocal exchange, like offering that gift to others to, as a way of benefit. And instead of just relying on money to facilitate that, it's just about exchanging one's time through this system of reciprocity. Have I got that right? Uh, you do. And certainly, you know, when Edgar Kahn wrote the text around time dollars and, you know, later wrote the the uh, follow up text to that, one of the key values around time banking has always been everyone is an asset. Everyone has something to offer. Everyone has something to share. And time banking is is both it's both a way to to practically meet needs, but it's also about orienting yourself towards recognizing that um the money economy values one particular sort, well, a few particular types of labor, right? And it, and it values them at very different scales. And when we, when we step back from the money economy, it has the opportunity for us to think about how do we want to value different forms of labor in our community? How do we want to value the care economy or care labor? How do we want to value someone who's moving into eldership? And this is something that I've, I've had actually show up in, in time banking facilitations and workshops where someone was like, I'm an older person. Um, I'm not really out going to, going to go move a couch or anything like that. I'm not sure exactly what I have to offer. And, you know, there were infinite stories. There was infinite wisdom. There was all sorts of advice that could be, be that could show up in, inside of this person. And sometimes it might just be companionship. So just recognizing that through the time bank, you can learn that there are lots of different things that people need that they would never ask someone to do for money. Right. They would never go out and try to give someone five dollars to spend an hour of time with them but they might ask for that in a time bank. And so the time bank is trying to get people in the practice and the habit of determining what is it that I need? What is it that I have to offer? And what do I need to show up well for those exchanges? You know, when I, when I think about this and when I listen to you, uh, it, it, not the first time, one of the things that really comes up is it's a cultural exchange and really almost a celebration uh, uh, at the same time. So it's, it's taken the idea of, of commerce and literally celebrating it in a cultural context as well. Right. Uh, and to me, that's just like, we, I don't normally hear leftists talk like that. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's for me, um, and this actually goes back to my relationship with the healthy food hub. So the healthy food hub had a very specific purpose for which it was set up. It was set up to provide a way for families that had unique diets inside of that school to access the foods that they needed to fulfill those diets and in some way connect them back to the food system. But the thing that happens when you set up a marketplace is that the thing that you intend to happen is not always the only thing that happens. And so what happened inside of the healthy food hub is that when people came into relationship around food, they also started to develop other relationships. You might learn about someone who had a particular health issue inside of the healthy food hub, and maybe you were just shopping alongside of them, you know, the first week, but by, you know, week seven, you know, of you having seen them regularly at, inside of the healthy food hub, you know something about their condition and you know whether or not they should be buying the thing that they're buying. And you might ask them about that. So, so just like that particular marketplace of the healthy food hub, the time bank is about creating bumping places so that as people get to know one another, they get inside of one another's lives. And perhaps you can expand the boundaries of home. You can expand the boundaries in which people care for other people um, with, without necessarily needing to, to monetize it. It's just, it's just you're learning about other parts of your community and other ways that people engage. Mike, I got to tell you, I can hear uh, producer uh, Jack Rabbit in my ears right now. And I bet what he's thinking is, yep, this is all beautiful. I hear you talk like this all the time, Cobb. What does it mean? <laughs> What's the practical application? So I'm going to uh, I'm going to push you to say, all right, this is beautiful. And I, I reckon that everybody who's watching or listening to this is like me, excited. It makes sense. Tell us how this actually works. Walk us through a very practical example of this. 
Absolutely. Um, so the the practical examples that I offered were uh, around the bike maintenance and around um, garage organizing. Those were individual to individual collab connections, right? So this is an individual to individual exchange. That's one application of time banking, being able to connect people in a community on a block in the same way that at, when we saw the rise of mutual aid and, and the top of the pandemic, um, develop these pod mappings and, you know, develop these ways that community pods and neighborhood pods were developing. This is what time banking is meant to do. It's meant to be a continuous way to map out the assets in a neighborhood. So you can do that on an individual to individual level. Now, let's think about an individual to an organization. So the Healthy Food Hub, um, at the time that we were running the Healthy Food Hub, we had a lot of demand for people who wanted us to open new distribution sites. Now, in order to open a new distribution site, we, need, we needed people. We needed, we needed additional bodies to do that. We didn't necessarily have additional money or funding coming in order to facilitate that, that transaction. So could we use time banking to do that? That is definitely something we tried. There are lots of learnings that I can offer about why, that, why it didn't work at that time. But I still think there's the possibility that an organization that's trying to get support for some of its programs and that that could show up on a time bank might have a way that it could facilitate an individual to an organization exchange and be able to get some of the support it needs for the programs and also be able to offer something else back to the community. So that's that's another element. Then you start to think about these individual to or, or pardon me, these organization to organization exchanges. So individual to individual, individual to organization, organization to organization. When you have two organizations, um, one thing that I know about my neighborhood, I live in, in Southeast Chicago in the Jeffrey Manor neighborhood, South Deering community area. And there are often organizations that have their own volunteer recruitment efforts going on at different times. Now, if you have 10 organizations and all of them individually are recruiting volunteers inside of those 10 different organizations, that's a lot of capacity that's being driven to a very specific purpose. And they might only need to use volunteers, um, say, four to six months out of the year. How can we make how can we find an infrastructure that these organizations could share where there's maybe content, a continuous pool of people who want to be involved and want to be engaged in a community? And then we can we can use that shared infrastructure to to always surface people who are willing to offer what we need. And so this is, a, this is what I think is the magic of time banking and the possibilities of time banking. We're trying to figure out how to build shared infrastructures that can be present at the different times when we need them. And so those are not like volunteer needs are like non-urgent, right? You just kind of need some volunteers to do some things for a short period of time. But what happens when there's an emergency? What happens when there's a pandemic? Do we have these shared infrastructures available to us at those emergency times? And so this is what the, what the possibility and the need and the practice of time banking is for. It's for building that infrastructure so that we have it to mobilize when we need it at those times. You know, Mike, I think that you've really uh, uh, brought us to a, a profound question slash comment that uh, that just came through live. Zimani asks, have you been able to see time banking at work inside a planned community versus the general society? The, would or does this distinction have an impact on what's being shared? Yes, it, it does. And oftentimes in planned communities and by planned communities, I think they might be rec um, speaking to intentional communities. Um, but inside of these intentional communities, they usually already have some sort of work share set up. And so it's not like time banking is maybe not as necessary because they might already be doing and facilitating activities that bring people together and that help people get involved in one another's lives. So you could certainly set up a time bank inside of a planned community or an intentional community, uh, but there, there might be other strategies that you might use inside of that, that context, especially if those people are already invested in one another. I want to encourage folks to continue to do what Zimani, uh, Catherine, and Kelly have done, which is to utilize the comment section. Uh, and I'm going to lift up Kelly Bigelow Becerra now, who asks, what is the groundwork for this to start in our own neighborhood? Ha! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so the, the, the funny thing that I will share that I often share when people ask me this question is, don't start a time bank. 
<laughs> so that that that's the that's the tongue in cheek advice. But that the, that advice is meant to say, don't start with the time bank. Like the time bank is actually not the first step. So um, there's a website that I'll reference, offersandneeds.com. And, you know, I'm referencing that to speak to the offers and needs market. Uh, that is something that I, I have supported groups with facilitating that I have trained other facilitators on alongside the, the members of the Post Growth Institute. But the, 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 the offers and needs market or other frameworks like it, getting communities together. I know that um, timebanks.org has, has uh, long since had something called gathering with a purpose, but you want to get people together first. And once you get people together, you want to get them to talk about what they have to offer. You want them to, to talk about what they need. You want them to be able to start the process of connecting around what they have to offer and what they need. And once people start doing that type of matchmaking in the room together, in relationship to one another, they might actually feel more voted, motivated. They might feel that this is something that actually has a practical um, value inside of their lives. And it might, you might actually get your first body of people who are committed to building out the time bank with you. You don't want to build out a time bank alone. Uh, you, you, you know, no, no systemic change happens alone. I mean, you know, that, that is just uh, an old organizing adage. And so ult ultimately, you want to get people together. You want to get people talking about those offers and needs. You want to get people exchanging in the room. And then once they've exchanged in the room, then you want to start building from that, that core group of people out to your larger community. And, and that's how you will make the time bank live and, and be active and be something that has continuity. And, you know, I, I will say uh, folks who are listening uh, and are viewing live or uh, to the recording, the Offers and Needs Market and the Post Growth Institute uh, is actually on deck. We're going to uh, uh, be actually walking folks through that. I'm curious, Mike, uh, the Offers and Needs Market is, again, I don't want to detract from the time bank, but it's so remarkably similar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I want to ask you, like the experience at the Cola Nut Collaborative, right? So are you saying that you act, the, the, the Cola Nut Collaborative emerged out of from Black Oak to the Food Hub uh, to like, oh, a need expressed itself? Or like walk us through that exact transition from mm -hmm. the Food Hub into the offers or, or the Cola Nut Collaborative? Yeah. So the the Healthy Food Hub had that specific need that I talked about in terms of us needing additional volunteer capacity to run the Healthy Food Hub. So we tried the experiment of testing the, the, the time bank as a way to attract new energy and new volunteers to help us run that run the Healthy Food Hub. Um, now, when I talked about maybe, you know, the, the nature of, of, of maybe failed experiments or just experiments where we learn, what we learned during, during that process was that we, we had to onboard people into how the food hub was operating. We had to onboard people into how to engage with the time bank. And we had to teach people about what time banking is. So trying to do all of those things at once is a bad idea, right? So ultimately, what, you know, what that experiment did teach me, though, is it showed me that there was actually great value in having the shared infrastructure so that when an organization like the Healthy Food Hub needs that capacity and needs that support, it's available for the organization already and the organization doesn't have to build it itself. So what, I'm, what I saw there was that the nature of building shared infrastructure outside of these organizations and or adjacent to these organizations is a really important thing. And it's, a, it's, it's something very similar to what I do at Open Collective Foundation around fiscal sponsorship. And so, the that's that's when the time bank actually spun off and became its own effort and started to engage other organizations around the city of Chicago to see are there applications where you could use something like this, this type of infrastructure. And we found that there were park districts that were trying to engage uh, public space. Um, there were networks of educators who were trying to better network themselves together. Uh, there were, you know, um, other entities like the Chicago Food Policy Action Council, which has this annual buyers and suppliers gathering. And at this point, you know, we've done three offers and needs markets with the Chicago Food Policy Action Council, helping those buyers and suppliers um, step into relationship with one another more deeply. So these are all places that things like the offers and needs markets and things like time banking allow people to 
show up differently in, in, in community and in space together. And this idea of showing up differently and uh, and how you're talking about it, I, again, I want to lift up uh, Z Manny in the in the comments uh, because he's making a what to me is a very astute observation. He says this notion of time versus value touches on something very deep. It seems it can help us address the fundamental blind stock spot between productive versus reproductive labor that seems so hard to talk about. And I'm just going to say, Z, uh, what you're doing is, at least to me and anybody else who knows, you're saying, oh, uh, man's read his mark, or person has read their marks, right? <laughs> uh, but I know that talking about social reproduction can get very uh, conceptual and very heady and very theoretical. But I think that Z-Money is onto something here. Like, this notion of the time bank puts it into very practical terms. We are reprodu reproducing our culture through these exchanges. Like, like, and it's actually showing, not telling what that means. Yeah. And so and when I talk about the sort of colonet as currency that has both value and values, um, that that's what I that's generally what I'm thinking of in terms of the exchange. So if I go into a 7-Eleven and I take five dollars and I buy a, a granola bar or something like that, that five dollars might leave my hand. I might get some change back. I get the granola bar. Maybe I have a witty remark or a conversation very briefly with the person, you know, at the counter. But there is not necessarily an encouragement in that transaction that there should be a relationship beyond that. The exchange is the exchange. But with the cola nut, you know, and, and, and talking about what happens inside of a time bank exchange, the, the, the desire of the time bank is not necessarily to speed up the velocity of transactions that happen in a community, but it's really to build stickier transactions. Transactions where once I know something about the elders in my community and the elders on my block, then it, it might create uh, a, a deeper need for me to think about, hey, maybe there's some programming that I should be organizing for that I wasn't aware of before. But now that I'm serving all of these different people who have these different needs, um, maybe there's something I can see beyond what I could see before. So it's meant to, to be a transaction that goes into a relationship, that goes into our lives, that goes into our hearts, that goes into our organizing. And it's, it's meant to actually, I mean, it, for me, even though it seems like it's just kind of an altruistic exchange, for me, it's a radicalizing thing. Like I am radicalized when I actually am able to see deeper into the lives of people in my community. And it makes me want to do more. And, you know, again, uh, Z Manny, thank you so much for bringing social reproduction into this particular conversation, because what it does, again, is, uh, and folks, I say it all the time, right? Theory without practice is mere contemplation. But practice without theory is just doing shit, right? And maybe something transformational will happen. But if it does, it will be by accident, right? Uh, and what Mike is describing with time banking applied in this way, and I do want to say, applied in this way, uh, it actually exposes, educates, and challenges existing social reproduction. Because social reproduction as a concept is just how do we reproduce the social structures and systems? And mainly it's on the basis of preconditions around demographics, education, inheritance of material property, legal titles, etc. It's really the maintenance and continuation of existing social relations. And because our existing relations are fundamentally racist, fundamentally sexist, fundamentally class oppressive, we are reproducing them whether we like it or not. When we go and buy that granola bar at the convenience store, we may not be intentionally saying, I'm going to uphold capitalism and white supremacy and heteropatriarchy, but we are. Yeah. Right. And that's the thing. When, 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 when we begin to engage in reciprocal relationships, meeting needs together, you take the money out of the equation, something different happens. And I think that this is back to Z-Manny and, and anybody else, Kelly, Catherine, uh, others who have already uh, join the uh, chat. Uh, I want to lift up the next comment uh, that Z Manny makes, and that is, Mike, do you think one can speak in terms of a human being's fundamental right to time? For one thing, as a prerequisite to having a functioning democracy. Yes. Um, yeah. So 
this actually, so this comes up often inside of time banking spaces because I am often asked, is it possible to implement a time bank in a space where there's time and equity, right? So there is there's an inequitable distribution and disbursement of time. You know, maybe there's the theory that we all have the same 24 hours, but we don't, you know, there are some people who need their, their more of their 24 hours to meet their fundamental human needs, to meet their household needs. And so ultimately um, the, the sort of fundamental right to time for me is that, and, and this actually goes to the way that time bank exchanges work. So time bank exchanges are all hour to hour. It's equal, right? It's an equal exchange of one hour to one hour. Now, there are some folks that, that you know, question that when we're, we're, we're doing these time salons or doing these offers and needs markets. They're, they're, they're like, why, you know, I mean, I have a skill that's highly valued in the money economy. Like, shouldn't my hour be worth two? No, it shouldn't. <laughs> they're, 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 your, your hour is actually voluntary. And also, if you have uh, earned more inside of this other economy that we recognize to be inequitable, then it's, a, it's possible that you might want to show up differently in this other economy that we are creating. In this relational economy, in this reciprocal economy that we're creating, we actually want people to who, who maybe have earned more in this other economy, show up with more of your time because, you know, this other economy is already rewarding you with money. And we want people who may have less time to think about, you know, it's OK if you need to ask for a bit more in this context, because we recognize that that reciprocity does not mean that we have to hold each other in debt servitude to one another. We can find ways to meet our broader community needs and we don't have to kind of use these um, these inequitable valuation systems that we've come out of to meet those needs. And we don't have to punish people for not having as much time to go out and, and, and support the rest of the community. So we, we wanna, we, this, the time bank is really meant to, it's meant to break culture, right? It, it is a transitional culture from a moneyed economy to ultimately, I, I don't think that in the future that I imagine of a solidarity economy that a time bank needs to exist. At some point, we don't necessarily need to measure this. And one of the stories that I often tell is actually of the time bank that inspired Colonet Collaborative. So we were inspired by a time bank out of St. Louis called Cowrie Collective, um, started by Chinyere Ote. And the Cowrie Collective had been going, you know, for a clear decade, you know, when when it when it was decided that it would close. Now, once that time bank shut down in St. Louis, it's not like the relationships that were developed in the time bank disappeared, right? People still had connections. People still had relationships. People were still engaged in one another's lives. So the value of the time bank keeps going on even after the time bank doesn't exist. And ultimately, I think that a time that the business of a time bank is to put itself out of business, right? We should phase out the time bank eventually, but we need a transitional phase from this place where we are accustomed to exchanging money uh, to where we're, we're, we become a little bit more culture to exchanging time. And then eventually we don't need, need a valuation system to, to measure our exchange. We, we are involved with one another at that point. I just got to say, I just want to remind folks, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only Trekkie uh, in the crowd, right? But remember in the Star Trek universe, money itself is obsolete, <laughs> right? Like, like, and that's, that's a, that is, that is a thing, right? And I also want to, especially in this sort of transitional mode, I want to lift up Catherine, uh, who did make a quip, which I think is both funny, but also an important one. Catherine says, hey, maybe sometimes we just want a granola bar. And mm -hmm. like, this is the thing, like the time bank is not meant to say, no, it replaces all the other ways uh, to, 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 to facilitate transactions, right? It's not an either or. Yeah, that I mean, very true. And and like I, I am maybe a little bit, you know, idiosyncratic in the time banking universe because there are some time bankers who swear off money altogether. They're like, there should be no money involved or adjacent or engaged around time banking. And the truth is that I recognize that, you know, in the in the the budget, you know, and and, and actually this comes out of uh, Stephanie Rierick and, and the Humans Network. So there's this budget spreadsheet that Stephanie Rierick developed. And in that budget spreadsheet, there is a place for time banking, there's a place for money, there's a place for swap, 
there's a place for barter. You know, I mean, there, there, there are different places and different modes of exchange for all of the different ways that you might decide to meet your needs. And the truth is, as we are exiting capitalism, right, as we're exiting the space where capitalism has, has our full attention, we might need multiple modes of exchange. And I'm not convinced that like time banking is, is going to meet all of the needs that are present in my community. So yeah, some people just need to go get a granola bar because they need to keep their energy up because maybe they're running Uber, right? You know, but ultimately we, we want to figure out how we can rest back time for those people too, right? So we want to give people different ways that they can exchange and meet their needs. And if time banking is a way that allows people to recover some of their energy and some of their time so that they don't have to pursue as much of the money economy, that's what I want to do, right? That's, that's what I'm most interested in. Folks, you're watching and or listening to Redneck Gone Green. I'm your host, David Cobb. I am the Redneck, and yes, I have gone green. We're talking to Mike Strode, uh, the founder and chief cooperator at the Cola Nut Collaborative. Mike is a both a theorist and practitioner of solidarity economy in multiple different ways. Mike, I got to lift up, too. You also dropped Stephanie Rerick, who is also on deck to be a guest on Redneck Gone Green. Stephanie is co-owner of Mother Fool's Coffee House and the founder and creative director of Humans United in Mutual Aid Networks, uh, also known as Human, uh, which I think, uh, which I, I just love that that name. <laughs> I, I want to circle back, uh, Mike, because you dropped, uh, you, you've used a phrase that uh, that I've emulated or tried to, to the best of my ability. It's you. I've heard you say it: "Good enough for now, safe enough to try." And uh, uh, and I I wonder if you could expound on that a little bit because you you touched on it a little bit earlier and I think that's so very important because some of us and I know I can be in this category feel like wait I don't have it all worked out yet so I'm not ready so tell us what you mean why do you often say good enough for now safe enough to try yeah and I I learned it as a part of uh, you know my training in sociocracy and you know my engagement with the consent decision making process. And so that's where the phrase comes from for me. But the, the reason that I use the phrase so often is because it is, it is very possible for the perfect to be the enemy of the good. And we often will pursue perfection um, to the hindrance of, to, to the detriment of trying an experiment. And so this is also why I say, don't start with the time bank. Start with a community of, of practice or a community of folks who are gathered together to explore this idea of exchanging with one another because that's good enough, right? That's a good enough starting point so that you can figure out if this has application in your community. And in, the important thing for me is not that this is a universal strategy, but it's that it is a strategy that is in your toolkit, that is in your toolbox, that you can explore and experiment and test out. And maybe you, you test it out and you figure, well, there are elements of this that really don't work for my community or it doesn't have broad application right now. I'll put it on the shelf and maybe I'll pick it up back, pick it back up later. But if you if you never step out and try to try a good enough experiment, then you won't have any data on which you can measure whether or not it's working. You know, I love that, too, because uh, and again, another thing that that I talk about, like, look, you know, you have to have a theory and the theory does not just mean an abstraction. Right. Theories like everybody has a theory, by the way, because a theory is just how things work, how the universe works. And it has a predictive, inherently a predictive assumption, like if this happens, then that. Right. Mm -hmm. So we all have a theory about how the world works. Frankly, most of us, our theory is unexplored, unexamined. It's just assumptions that we make, but we haven't really explored it. Right. But what I like about this is that this is grounded in a theory about human need, about how to get human needs met. And that like what I like about it is it doesn't assume that humans are either fundamentally angelic. Nor does it assume that human beings are fundamentally demonic. Right. Uh, it actually uh, and it, it, to me, that's sort of that reflects a theoretical understanding of how humans actually are, which is. We basically do what we're incentivized to do, right? Uh, okay. And what this is doing is finding a way to incentivizing the better parts of ourselves uh, and to offer it in. It's really a gift economy when you really get down to it, right? Like, yeah. or it's 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 moving us in that direction. Am I am I going too far? 
No, you're 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 absolutely right. And this is why I say that like eventually I don't think that I think the time bank would phase itself out. You know, um one of the 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 ways that I talk about both the time bank and the offers and needs market is that um I am a new grandfather, right? And as this uh, you know, as this grandbaby was being born, you know, we were having a baby shower. And, you know, what's a baby shower? It's a place where people get together and they kind of give out gifts and, you know, shower, you know, the 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 new parents with what what they might need. Now, um, as we were preparing for this baby shower, I was thinking about how can I bring more of myself into this this moment that we were having. And what I ended up doing at that baby shower is that I put up in a, a wall and I put out these cards on the table and I said, you know, um, it was one offer, uh, one piece of advice. And then, you know, there was something else, um, you know, um, some, something else that I, I had three lines on there, but essentially I was creating inside of this baby shower and offers and needs market so that we could have people who may, you know, not want to get a larger gift, you know, have another way to meet the needs of this family that was developing and, and show up for, for, for that family. And so for me, it's, um, it, it's ultimately about the, this practice per, pervading my life. And so I've probably got more hours on the time bank than I ever need. Like I, I don't ever really need to go into the time bank to, to, to exchange. And I'm, I, I have very little interest in it because I like have a lot of my needs met. And so there, there will come a point where people are so engaged with this process, they're so invested in, 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 in how this shows up in their life that maybe they're not necessarily interested in getting, getting the, re the reciprocity back because they know they can ask for it when they need it, right? I have a neighbor that I know I can go to and speak, speak to about like checking for my packages or, you know, watching the house or um, closing my garage door if I left it open, right? I don't necessarily have to put that on the time bank. And that is, that is what I think is the, the, the magic of the incentive. The incentive is really meant to get people into a habit. But once they have the habit, you can just throw the incentive out. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a time bound thing. So that's, that's how I see time banking. And it's interesting, too, because uh, your last comment makes me think about one of the things that I've heard you talk about in other spaces. And that is how the time bank actually fosters innovation. Uh, and innovative problem solving. And it feels like, can you say, can you say a little bit about that? Like what you mean whenever you talk about how it encourages people to think creatively about, uh, yeah, to think creatively about their own needs and how to get them met? Yeah. So, you know, um, I'll, I'll connect that to talking about the time banking as an, as an arc for the solidarity economy, right? And so when we think about the solidarity economy, there are sometimes these larger, more massive structures we think about, right? We think about worker cooperatives, housing cooperatives, participatory budgeting, um, community land trust. And what I've often talked about in spaces where, where I'm, I'm sharing about the relationship between time banking and solidarity economy is that every one of those things I've just named is hard. It requires deep cooperation, deep collaboration, a lot of conflict resolution, a lot of facilitation, all these skills that we're not necessarily sure when we start out these efforts that we have available to us. And so the time bank is a way for us to actually map what those skills are that are present in our community. And then we, we and, and it's possible that when you see this sort of map of skills that are present in your community, you realize that you can solve problems that you didn't know that you had the skills to solve. And so the, the time bank is meant to be maybe a way to open up your, your mind about what's available to you. And then once you know more about what's available to you, you might be more willing to tackle a much bigger problem. And, and so one of the, the, the sort of elements of, that I've, I've referenced around the pod mapping and, the, um, the, and the, the pandemic response in 2020 is that they, we didn't necessarily know that we had the infrastructure at that time to build modern mutual aid networks. But it was only once people started doing pod mapping and started building relationships that we realized that, hey, not only do we have the, 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 the sort of skill to build mutual aid networks, but also there's an additional infrastructure and fiscal sponsorship that can support us in, in continuing to keep these networks alive, even after maybe the, the sort of volunteer capacity has diminished a bit or waned a bit. You know? So I think that having these structures in place having this this shared infrastructure having this network this database of skills allows us to see beyond 
what what our immediate vision can see. Folks, you're watching and or listening to Redneck Gone Green. I'm your host, David Cobb. I am the Redneck. I have gone green. I want to thank you for joining this conversation. Remind you to share this podcast and or live stream. Subscribe to us on YouTube or Rumble uh, or Substack. The Substack is important because I try to do a writing every time uh, to describe like who the top, uh, who the guest is, not just with the bio, but a short little essay about why, right? And I hope you'll go to the Substack and take a look, Mike, uh, about and and make any correction if I've uh, if I have uh, incorrectly described uh, the time banking. So one thing I want to do uh, before we do sign off, Mike, uh, uh, is to give you an opportunity for any closing thoughts. Uh, uh, you know, we've spent fifty minutes together in conversation, and anything that came up. Anything that I didn't ask that I should have, uh, just final thoughts from you. Absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'm going to steal some final thoughts from my grief deck. Uh, so, you know, if you can see that, uh, grief deck, rituals, meditations, and tools for moving through loss. Um, so this is something I, you know, one of my, my particular skills that I actually learned through starting the Colonel Collaborative around facilitation is you know the, the, the many decks that I have in my house are really part of my facilitation practice because I've, I've learned that facilitation is a really important skill for time banking, for cooperatives, um, and for some of these, these structures that we're trying to build that require groups of people to move together in, in, uh, in, in unison. So um, I've pulled a thought from my grief deck and what you have in the grief deck is you have these little images that show up in the grief deck and on the back, you have a little a reflection. And I just pulled this from the top of my grief deck today. And it says, let others know what you need. It is a good idea to clearly communicate with caring friends and family what would be most helpful to you in your grief journey. They may need to be educated on common expressions of grief to provide optimal support. Take a moment to ask yourself, what would be helpful to hear right now? What does support look like right now? Who might be able to offer that support call, text, or email someone to ask for something you need. And one of the, the greatest challenges when launching a time bank is, is that it's, it's sometimes easier for people to, to speak about what they have to offer, speak about their skills and their assets and their capacities. It's sometimes easier to speak about that than it is for people to name what they need. And so I would encourage the folks who are, are looking at this broadcast and, and reflecting tonight to, to spend some time thinking about what is it that I need? And, and oftentimes what we find when we start digging in these layers, you know, oftentimes when I pose this question to people, they might actually start with, I need X number of dollars. And then you ask them, what do you need the money for? And they might say, well, I need to fix my, the roof on my garage or fix the roof on my house, or I need to fix my porch, or I need to repair my car. And then wh what you discover there is that once you go one layer beyond, what they need money for, you might find that there's something else that they need that is more material and that you actually might find someone in the community that can fulfill that need. And, you know, hey, we, we don't know if that person might need money to fulfill that need. But this is, this is a practice and this is a process. Reflecting on your own needs helps you to be very clear when you're in relationship with other people about naming those needs and giving voice to those needs and being able to create a, a space wherever you are so that people can clearly articulate what they need and what they have to offer. And that's the basis. That's the grounding. That's the soil in which you start to cultivate both time banks or offers and needs markets or any of these practices around cooperation and collaboration that we've talked about this evening. I'm going to bring Jack Rabbit in. Uh, Jack Rabbit, uh, for longtime listeners and viewers, I say long time, it's our fourth episode, but you know, Jack Rabbit is our producer. Uh, and Jack, how's this conversation going? Because I know that you weren't that familiar with time banking uh, when we started 54 minutes ago. Yeah, no, I feel like I've learned so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I can't, uh, I can't begin to uh, let you know how much I appreciate this. And I'm, I'm sure that, uh, you know, we're getting a lot of great uh great feedback from the folks who are watching. But uh, yeah, you know, I think that one of the things that I've kind of like gotten from this is, is how important it is to reconfigure our approach towards each other and community and really kind of reeducate ourselves away from the 
commodification of capitalism and the way that it kind of like dehumanizes us. Like there, there was a, a number of different things that you mentioned, Mike, that really, uh, really struck me. Uh, you know, one of them was this idea of like that the way that time banking, well, one of the things I, I'd like to hear you kind of touch on is the way that time is time. Like my time, my life is no greater or lesser than your time and your life, right? And that's something that I think is is so lovely to, uh, so magical to kind of co- reconnect with, you know. Um, can you kind of, can you talk about that, about about how there it's almost kind of, there's a leveling in a, in a sense that, that time banking does. Can you kind of speak to that a bit? And like the transition away from like, like commodification, the, the commodification of, of ourselves as, 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 you know, just like these objects to be bought and sold. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's one of those time banking adages. Every hour is an hour, right? Every, every hour is equal. And what I, what I love to get people to reflect on in, in transitioning into that reality is to think about what are the jobs that keep, or what are the, what is, what is the work that keeps your community afloat? Um, who cuts the grass, who tends the parks, who cleans the streets, who attends to the housing. Like if any one of those, those, those pieces of work were left undone, what would be the state of your community? And if we think about labor and work like that, then ultimately there is no job that should be devalued, right? There's there's no no amount, no type of work that needs to necessarily be devalued in that context. And every every bit of labor is important because you couldn't do whatever is the job that allows you to to accrue, you know, you know, um, several thousand dollars a day or whatever it is that you might be making if you didn't have these other pieces of work happening in our community. And so for in in that context is where I think about all of these hours are equal because all this work is important and all of this work is needed to build a community. And we've just created a society where we've just named it like, oh, you know, this feels like more important work or you spent more time in school and therefore I want to bump your pay to this astronomical amount. But all work is important. So I just want to say Kelly gives a big shout out to you, Jack Rabbit, uh, appreciating uh, your key point. Mike, I want to let you know also before we sign off that Catherine was really uh, intrigued, inspired and curious about the grief deck. Uh, and I'm going to ask you, can we can you come back on uh, at some future uh, time and we spend a little more time on that grief deck? Because I think that would be an interesting conversation. Absolutely. Uh, it, And I want to thank all of you for joining us here on Redneck Gone Green. Remember, we come to you every week uh, with a practitioner of how do we get to a new world, one that is peaceful, just, democratic, and ecologically sustainable. Uh, This will be, this goes beyond the ain't it awful into the how, what is the world we want, and how do we get there? In that spirit, next week, we'll be joined by Michelle Edelman McCormick. Michelle is a co-founder of Cooperation Vermont, uh, uh, and she is also the general manager of the Marshfield Village Store, which, check this out, over 100 years of doing commerce, and she and others just transformed it, transitioned it, into a worker-owned cooperative. Lots of lessons learned there. Remember, folks, the new world that we want is possible. We know we have it in our heads. We hold it in our hearts. All we have to do is use our hands to build it. Peace.